introduce Mr. Gaffney, I'd like to call out to one of our, our most active and dynamic members. She's been with the RJC probably as, as long as I have been, Irene Halton. Many of you know Frank Gaffney is the founder and president of the Center for Security Policy. But Frank is much more than that. He is a commentator, he's a columnist, um, he is a radio talk show host. And more than anything, the way I see Frank is someone who daily wages the war for the free world. Um, Mike and I met Frank in August 06, and we had heard Frank on uh, Monica Crowley regularly, and we were always impressed with the clarity. However, that night we went to see him at um, a showing of obsession, which he did in August 06 at the 57th, on 57th Street at the Directors Guild. Some of you might have been there that night. We were at the second showing. Um, Frank led the discussion afterwards, which was quite, uh, in, quite in, in, ensued a, a discussion that was very, very dynamic. And afterwards, we went up to Frank and we uh, engaged him in discussion. Frank had just recently written the book, um, War Footing. And although he wasn't hawking the book, we ended up buying the book. In fact, it was the last copy of the book that he had. And um, we ended up buying it. And I remember then why it was August 06, because as I was looking through my book the other day, Frank had signed it and put the date. So it wasn't because I had good memory that I read up that I remembered it. But what struck me was what Frank wrote in, in the book that day. He wrote to Mike and Irene with best regards, and thanks for your help in waging and winning the war for the free world. Although I hadn't really done that much to wage the fight at that point. I didn't realize how prophetic Frank's personal autograph words would be. It was probably within the next year that someone brought to my attention an article stating that New York City Department of Ed was going to begin an Arab American public school. It was probably at this juncture uh, that his words began to sink into my mind. And from that day forward, I couldn't rest until something was done about this travesty. As a retired teacher, I knew full well that Arabic was never requested, nor did they have a regents exam for the language. I'd never been an activist, but innately knew that something was rocky in the state of Denmark. And I knew enough to understand that taxpayers should not have to contribute to this poorly thought out idea. Part of the goal was to teach half of the courses in Arabic. I started musing with others and saying, what will they teach in Arabic? American history? <laughs> <laughs> Consequently, I had recently joined the RJC leadership and was attending our first leadership meeting in Florida, in the Ritz-Carlton in Palm Beach. One of the most riveting panels was that on Islamofascism and the threat to this country. Frank was on that panel. That was the second time I met Frank Gaffney. One of the great features of the leadership meeting is the advantage to have the time to engage speakers and get more of a one-on-one -on -one response. But now the words he had written in, his, in my book had a meaning for me. I approached the other participants with the problem that I was seeing in New York, and although I received sympathy, it was only Frank who really paid attention. It was a special interchange because we even got to know Frank's charming and wonderful wife, Marisol. She became a cheerleader for our cause. Frank understood the depth of the problem, but did not have the resources at the time to support any action. I went back to New York. Daniel Pipes continued writing his articles. The Post was, it, was expressed their outrage, and the Chancellor and the Mayor paid no attention. But then there was my third meeting with Frank Gaffney, and that one was the show. While at the leadership in Florida, leadership meeting in, in Florida, I became friends with another leader named Sarah Stern. Sarah Stern is the founder and president of MET 
Endowment for Middle East Truth, which is a pro-Israel advocacy group. Sarah is up on the hill constantly. Uh, soon after our return, Sarah sent me an invite to her first annual, and there have been others since then, fundraiser and Ray of Light dinner. Sarah honors and tries to make it bipartisan, and she honors, uh, it's very hard to make it bipartisan, but if you know Sarah Stern, she's able to pull this off better than anyone else I ever know. And that's because she invites a lot of people to for Shabbat dinner. She does wonders over Shabbat dinner. Um, and Sarah honors at every year, and she tries to honor Muslims who speak out and who are courageous uh, in speaking out against the problems that they see. She also honors columnists um, and writers and legislators in relation to being pro-Israel. Um, from having interacted with Sarah, I knew I wanted to support this wonderful lady. And so a group of us from New York drove down to be at this spectacular event. And who is the MC of that? Why, Frank I had no idea that Frank and Sarah were good friends. It was about five weeks since I had spoken to Frank in Florida, and so this was our third meeting. As soon as I walked up to him to say hi, he looked at me with recognition and pointed at me and stated, I want you to be on a conference call next week. He gave me the name of the person to contact, but I didn't think to find out what this entailed. <coughs> so, I joined this call, and not knowing what to expect or what I could contribute, the next thing I hear is Frank on the call asking if Irene Alter was on the line, and could I present the problem that we are having in the book. I certainly was caught off guard, but the best I could. And then I heard this voice on the other end who said he was an attorney and would be willing to take this on. All those months of losing sleep, worry, were ended in that moment. I felt the troops that arrived in the name of David Jewish. I knew now I was not alone. It turns out that this was a perfect storm because there were other women in New York, two others to be exact, who were also losing a lot of sleep over this. However, if and we and we did find each other, however, if we did not have Frank and the sense of the security policy to help steer us in what we were doing, the seeds would have been firmly planted here in New York. We uprooted them for a time, and now they have come back with level two, the ground zero mosque. They're all part of the same fight. So, although many of us never know what really goes on in organizations that we support, I can tell you that the Center for Security Policy, the organization which Frank founded and is, of which he is the president, has impacted on all of us, and here in New York and is an organization worthy of all of our support. The work that Frank does is massive, and there is never enough, or never enough resources. However, Frank is tireless in his efforts, and I can't think of anyone more worthy of our support. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming my mentor and friend. <laughs> I, I do a lot of public speaking and I get introduced a lot of times as a result and you get introduced sometimes okay and sometimes not so okay but I, I've never been introduced with that kind of feeling. I really thank you. I am, uh, I'm almost so moved that I can't go on. But I better, I better <laughs> the show must go on in this. Um, thank you all for coming out. Uh, I have to say I was a little disappointed. I was convinced you all was going to go somewhere else with that oldest profession thing. <laughs> as long as we're here, we'll uh, honor the investment bankers. <laughs> I want to say thank you to um, to him and to uh, our friends, Peter Bernstein, uh, as well as, of course, the RJC for making it possible for him to talk to you. Um, that's not exactly where I thought we would start, but there we go. Um, I just wanted to say I've got about 
an hour's worth of conversation with you here that I'm going to try to condense into about 20 minutes. This will be a fire hose. Um, I'll give you a flavor of a lot of stuff, and if you want to go back into it, we can. But it's really important to me, and I hope it's going to be valuable to you to have questions and answers. So I'm going to try to reserve as much time for that. What I'm here to talk about uh, has probably come to your attention before now. I wish I could say that it had come to the attention of our government in the way that I think it should have before now, um, or even now that it was before their attention in the way that it should be. Um, but suffice it to say that what you just heard in the way of a personal testimony as to what an individual, or in this case a couple, and a few others can do. That what I really want to leave you with is not only a sense of a serious problem, but a sense of empowerment. That there are things that you can do, and indeed that you must do, to help this one come out right. Or else, as they say. I'm going to be talking about this book. We do have copies of it here. Um, even if you decide you don't want to buy it, you can get it for free. If you buy it, it helps us give it away to other people who we wouldn't otherwise be able to give it to. So I encourage you to do it. <coughs> but it's shariathethreat.com. You can just download it or read it at your convenience. Or you can get it for something like 99 cents on a Kindle. So, you know, find a way to get it. But please take it to heart. I'm going to touch upon, as I say, some of the key points about it. But I'm going to move at light speed, so hold on to your seats. The book, Newt Gingrich says it's a must read. He's right. Um, it is a team effort, much as our previous book, War Footing, was a team effort. This is a product of 19 of the best people I know in the national security beat, many of them with tremendous credentials in intelligence and military activities and affairs and at least sort of security policy more broadly defined. They came together to address the problem posed by these guys, the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm gonna focus on them as a kind of microcosm that allows us all to sort of get our head around a much bigger enterprise, which these guys, as you'll see, are trying to impose. This is a prescription for what they call Sharia, the triumph of a politico-military legal program that is comprehensive in character, absolutely totalitarian, and supremacist. The next time you hear someone who adheres to this program accuse you or anybody else of being a racist, and a bigot. <coughs> Turn the mirror around. Because what this is all about is the ultimate incorporation and they seek to implement a supremacist program unlike anything really the world has seen. The uh, Brotherhood is seeking to do two things, as this slide suggests. One, to promote and impose Sharia, and to reestablish a theocratic form of government known as the Caliphate. In fact, the impetus behind the Brotherhood being created in 1928 was to undo what Ataturk did in Turkey, which was to get rid of the Caliphate. The key point is this second bullet, the objectives of the Muslim Brothers, the Ikhwan, as they call themselves in Arabic, and Al-Qaeda are identical. The next time someone, like the Director of National Intelligence, tells you that this is largely a secular organization, you might point this out to me. The only difference is the modalities. The Muslim Brotherhood is very practical, where it 
believes, as was practiced by Muhammad in his life, you can't use violence effectively to accomplish these goals. It will pursue what are sometimes called, by among others, the Director of National Intelligence, nonviolent means. In point of fact, they are pre-violent. As you'll see, these guys are all about making you feel subdued, as the Quran says. Um, the Brotherhood's, I think, principal <coughs> hallmark, in the West at least, is this idea of stealthy jihad. And when I say your government is not adequately attuned to all of this, it's the complete failure to appreciate the stealth jihad, or what the Brotherhood calls civilization jihad, that is the most dramatic example of that shortcoming. They um, are seeking, by their own words, as you'll see right here, in a document that, if you don't get this book for any other reason, I hope it will be to read this particular document. The appendix to this book is what's known as the Explanatory Memorandum on the General Strategic Goals of the Group, which is a pretty awkward way of saying their strategic plan. As of 1991, as best we can tell, it hasn't changed an iota, even though this particular plan has been compromised. It's interesting, uh, this is a fun fact to know and tell, it came into the hands of the U.S. government back in 2004 when an alert Maryland Transportation Authority cop happened to observe a couple driving a car back and forth across a huge artery down in my neck of the woods, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. A woman was wearing some kind of head covering. What caught his eye, I think, most was she was videotaping the structural supports of the bridge as she drove back and forth. He thought wisely, this doesn't look good. He pulled them over, he ran their IDs, he established that the driver, a fellow by the name of Ismail Elvarasa, was wanted on a material witness arrest warrant in connection with Hamas activities out of Chicago. That gave rise to a search warrant, which the FBI executed going top to bottom in their home in Annandale, Virginia, a suburb of Washington, D.C., about 20 minutes from the seat of government. I said top to bottom, actually they went below the bottom because they found a secret sub-basement, in which, interestingly enough, were the archives of the Muslim Brotherhood in America. This document was one of thousands that were in it, particularly helpful because, among other things, it said this about the mission of the Muslim Brotherhood. It is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within, sabotaging its miserable house with their hands, meaning ours, and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. I read that to you simply because it's kind of hard to see how you can construe this as either secular or nonviolent, <laughs> except by ignoring it altogether. <clears throat> Similarly, ignoring the phased plan, which also came into the government's possession. I'll go through this again very quickly. Five phases. Phase one, a secret leadership. By the way, if you can read these uh, slides, the italicized passages are particularly interesting because that's their assessment of how they're doing. Phase two is after you've got the secret leadership established is a gradual appearance on the public scene and exercising and utilizing various public activities. They're making some pretty good progress with this, as they say, including 
infiltrating various sectors of the government. Now again, this isn't me telling you that's what I think is going on. This is the Muslim Brotherhood telling you this is exactly what they are doing. Phase plan three, the escalation phase. Prior, well here's another of those non-violent words. Prior to conflict and confrontation with the rulers through using the mass media, currently in progress, they say. Understated, to say the least. Tonight I'm going from here to a, a Fox Business Network co-down with one of the CARE representatives, the Council on American Relations. And I will try to point out to him, you know, phase three. Phase four, the open public confrontation. How about that? The open public confrontation with the government through exercising the public pressure approach. Anybody follow Pete King's hearings a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. Uh, do you know about Dick Durbin's tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, Pete King's, for those of you who are not following this, were about the problem within the Muslim community, for which he took an immense amount of grief from these guys who use political pressure to try to shut him down, or at least to smear him so badly that he would be rendered ineffectual. To his great credit, he stood his ground, he did the hearings, I think he broke through it a really important taboo. Damage control is Dick Durbin tomorrow in the Senate Judiciary Committee where he will have four witnesses, all of whom are either working for or are Muslim Brotherhood operatives. Oh. And you will hear there, I'm reasonably sure, unless some of the Republicans actually show up and make, you know, some important points that uh, encourage them to make. The, the, the line that you'll be hearing, which directly applies this political pressure approach, is the greatest threat we actually face today is not terrorism. It's Islamophobia. Oh, I'm not making this up. They actually have government officials who are saying Phase five, though, those government officials are going to get their comeuppance when they seize power to establish their Islamic nation under which all parties and Islamic groups are united. Again, you just got to wonder what the Director of National Intelligence was thinking. Or who he's been talking to. You can't probably read this very well, but the point is that when they talk about influencing the government, they're not just talking about directly influencing or penetrating or subverting the government. They're talking about all aspects of our civil society. And at the end, if I have time, I'm gonna go quickly through how they're doing this uh, in terms of the infrastructure they've built. But suffice it to say that their idea of civilization jihad is rooted in this notion of running influence operations against us at every level. And they're making considerable progress, as that earlier uh, phase plan describes. Not only by insinuating Muslim brothers into positions of influence, including literally into the government, but also through using techniques like taqiyya to confuse us, using yeah, I got into that next. Sorry. Takiya to confuse us and to keep us witless about what they're doing. I'm going to give you in the next slide and a couple that follow from it a very quick, short course on how this effort to suppress our awareness of what the Muslim Brotherhood is about in America actually is working. Okay? It's a crude technique, but it gives you a flavor of the problem. This is a word count taken from the 9-11 Commission report. You're all familiar with the Blue Ribbon Commission that tried to figure out what on earth was going on when 19 Sharia adherent jihadists hijacked planes and flew them into buildings down the road 
not in my neck of the woods, shouting as they killed thousands of our countrymen, Allahu Akbar. Not surprisingly, words like Islam appear hundreds of times, Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood a few, Jihad, and so on. But some of the Muslim brothers did not think this was sensible. So they complained bitterly and suggested that the United States government really could find other terms to describe what's going on without giving offense to them. And you know, they're easily offended. <laughs> so here's what happened, in, just as an example, 2008, when the FBI, the agency responsible for providing our first line of defense against threats from within the United States, Jeez. where did all those words go? Well, they must, oh, 2009, the National Intelligence Strategy, none of those words all right, well, here's this will for sure work. The Fort Hood After Action Report, where a jihadist whose business card said Soldier of Allah, whose PowerPoint presentation to his comrades said, It's my obligation under Sharia to kill you if you're going to kill my co religionists. And who shouted, what, has he killed 13 of his comrades? You've seen this movie. Okay, not here either. And I could give you half a dozen other examples. This is what the military calls information dominance. If you can't accurately describe the enemy, we know going back to Sun Tzu 5,000 years ago, you're not going to And this is just one small indicator of how little we do understand. Just a couple of other examples of techniques. Demanding concessions, I won't go through this at length. I'd love to talk to you if you care to, uh, anybody interested in finance here, about Sharia compliant finance. Suffice it to say that the first clue there's a problem here, the first word. Blasphemy and slander. This is an ongoing business. It was evident in what I just showed you, that information dominance thing. It turns out it's absolutely integral to Sharia that you're not supposed to do anything, say anything, publish anything, screen anything that would give offense to these guys. And unfortunately, in 2009, September to be precise, in the UN Human Rights Commission, the United States government co-sponsored with the Organization of the Islamic Conference a slightly watered down version of their resolution that says, we want every UN member not only to prohibit expression that gives offense to Islam, but to criminalize it. So watch this space. This is a serious problem. And in the courts, I can go on about that too. Just You may have seen the stories uh, circulating last week where in Tampa, Florida, a state judge said to Muslims who wanted to use Florida state law, no, no, you have to use Sharia law. Ecclesiastical Islamic law. This is, this is, you know, kind of watch this space guide to how a stealthy kind of jihad is insinuated largely without any of us even knowing it's going on. And you wake up one fine day and you're Europe. Where they now have, speaking of courts, 87 Sharia courts that operate side by side and essentially of equal stature to English common law courts. Wow. Or you wake up in France, maybe, and you've got 751 no-go zones where Sharia is practiced and the authorities dare not enter. Watch, this is going to be interesting. On April 11th, Nicolas Sarkozy's ban the Burka bill. Did you hear about this? Yeah. 
kind of wrest back from these guys, pride of France, no burkas. I'd be willing to bet you they're still wearing burkas in those 751 no-go zones after the 11th. Okay, um, I've talked a little bit about uh, the Holy Land Foundation trial. This was where this treasure trove of Muslim Brotherhood documents was entered into evidence. Interestingly enough, uncontested. It was also the case that 300 organizations and individuals were identified as what were known as unindicted co-conspirators. The prosecution's idea was they go for the low-hanging fruit, the five people directly involved in raising money through the Holy Land Foundation for Hamas, get those convictions, which they did in 2008, and then they'd go start rolling up the other 300. Uh, the U.S. Attorney in Dallas didn't calculate on Eric Holder being the Attorney General of the United States. And they were not given permission to do that follow-on. And we now hear these guys say, I'm sure I'll hear it tonight from this care guy when I confront him with being an unindicted co-conspirator of this organization. To say nothing of a Hamas front organization owned and operated by the Muslim Brotherhood. He'll say, well, that wasn't proven in court. <laughs> That's kind of a gotcha, don't you think? If Eric Holder didn't let it be proven in court, it's not proven in court. But we may just get a few Republican Jews get out there and get your other Jews friends to do something about oh, yeah. not yeah. electing yeah. Barack Obama again. Yeah. We might actually yeah. Uh, I just want to show you, just to give you a sense, and I know I'm over time now, but I just want to give you a sense of the infrastructure these guys have built. And this is going to be a quick course, okay? Um, this is the document, again, attached to the Muslim Brotherhood strategic plan. Remember I showed you the mission statement at the beginning? Well, this was at the end. Under the headline, a list of our organizations and organizations of our friends. Imagine if they all march according to one plan. Imagine, because they are marching according to one plan. On this list are 29 different organizations. As of 1991, it was early days. The first had been founded in 1963, and they hadn't really spiked up as they did in this decade and then beyond. But the point is that these 29 represent, even today, the most prominent most powerful, most influential Muslim American organizations in the United States, without exception. So when you hear Jim Clapper say, I'm sorry, you didn't get the just he was giving. When you hear him say, as he did to Diane Sawyer back in December, you, you, you heard about this interview even if you didn't see it because that was the one where he had to admit twice to not knowing anything about one of the biggest busts of jihadists in Western history that day. Uh, not only through sensitive intelligence channels he should have known about, but it was all over the television, <laughs> including the one he was on. <laughs> but he actually, you know, said something that I thought was of really enduring importance in the course of that interview when he said he regarded the Muslim community as a source of, quote, advice, counsel, and wisdom when it comes to finding and ferreting out the extremists in their midst. Well, I'm reasonably sure the guys that he's turning to for advice, counsel, and wisdom are on that list. <laughs> Muslim brothers without exception, because they might have been the ones who told him that the Muslim Brotherhood is a largely secular organization that has eschewed violence, and is now consumed with good works like daycare and hospitals. Was that kind of possible? Pay to the bank. Anyway, I'm hoping that might come up tomorrow. We'll see. Um, okay, the infrastructure. Here we go. 
Uh, MSA, the recruiters, now on this uh, slide actually says 250. I'm told it's actually 600 college campuses across America where they are trying to get kids to become part of their Dawa enterprise, recruiting them for ultimately jihad. The financiers, this is a particularly important organization, the North American Islamic Trust, a Saudi-funded organization used basically to buy up the mortgages of mosques. Once you got the mortgage, what else do you get? You get to pick the imam, you get to pick the textbooks for the madrasas, you get to put your books and videos and other jihadist materials into the bookstores, you get to do training for their battalions, as they call them. Not a good thing. Um, the Settlers, uh, this is the follow-on to the Muslim Students Association, started in 1981 in Indiana, and now the largest Muslim Brotherhood Front organization in the United States. If Jim Clapper actually were to answer the question as to who he thinks of when he thinks of sources of advice, counsel, wisdom, he's thinking first and foremost about Islam. Because they're all over this administration, including doing prayers at the uh, DNC prayer meeting and being at the White House iftar dinners and so on. Um, ISNA's impact, just to give you a sense of it, it actually extends back to the Bush administration. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, I, we don't have time to get into much of this except to say these are really bad guys. Their chapters are all over the country where they exist. They have as a requirement that they have arbitration panels. So you see, just as you've watched this thing unfold in Britain, or maybe not watched it, but it has unfolded, you see the incubator for those Sharia courts in America beginning to begin to cook in their uh, there are no chapters. The FIC Council, again, this is probably more information than you need, but this is the judiciary. When they look to Sharia authorities to explain what is Sharia compliant, for example, in finance, and what is not, these are the guys they're going to. They're the enforcers of the ideological purity of the Muslim Brotherhood. CARE, my personal favorite. CARE is, of course, the strike force. How do we know this? Well, among other things, we know it because when an organization, CARE was not founded until, as you see here, um, 1994. This organization was on the Muslim Brotherhood list in the explanatory memorandum. CARE was not. But this one begat, the Islamic Association for Palestine begat CARE. And we know that because in the day, the FBI actually was doing surveillance on these guys. And they had the organizational meeting wiretap. And among other things that was introduced into evidence in that Holy Land Foundation trial were the recordings of several of the care leading operatives talking about how they were going to establish a strike force for Hamas in the United States, not just to help raise funds for it, but to wage political warfare on its behalf. Uh, they helped get elected that guy who you saw blubbering at Pete King's hearings, perhaps, Keith Ellison. Uh, their mission is absolutely to run interference for the Brotherhood in every way possible, from lawfare, where they're suing people like us, to demonstrations, to those sort of public assaults on people like Pete King and so on, endlessly manipulating the media and other forms of political warfare. I'm going to close with this particular piece of the infrastructure, which may shock you. It would be peculiar in the extreme, I think, if the Muslim Brotherhood, which has set its sights on destroying us from within by our own hand were to run influence operations against absolutely every aspect of our country. Not just the government, but as I've shown you, the civil society as well. And somehow, 
overlooked the community that arguably would be the most likely to oppose them. Namely, if there are still any, national security minded Republicans and conservatives. I say that only somewhat facetiously for reasons I'm about to explain. This, in fact, was not an oversight. They did not neglect the conservative movement. In fact, starting in 1999, a chap whose picture I'll show you in a moment by the name of Abdurrahman al -Amudi. At the time, arguably the uberfuhrer of the Muslim Brotherhood in America, he ran an organization which he founded called the American Muslim Council. But he was on the board of directors, or he was an officer of most of the other Muslim Brotherhood front groups. He also, by virtue of his influence operations, had secured from the Clinton-Gore administration the right to recruit, train, and credential Muslim chaplains for the United States military and prison system. Now, I just ask you. Are there two populations that you less like to have the Muslim Brotherhood training and indoctrinating? I can't think of it. Well, in uh, 1999, as I say, Abdurrahman al Amudi, the picture is here, you can see it on the lower left, signed out at least two $10,000 checks to start up this Islamic Institute, as it's called here, or Islamic Free Market Institute. He also provided his deputy, a fellow by the name of Khalid Safuri, to run it initially. Khalid Safuri had been it when he was running operations in Bosnia on behalf of the Mujahideen there. Khalid Safuri was with him in the American, the Muslim Americans, uh, American Muslim Council. And Khalid Safori was the guy who was going to be the point man for running the influence operation against Republicans. He did it so well that he became the Bush Campaign 2000 Muslim Outreach Coordinator. This guy, at the end, you think about, a fellow by the name of Suhail Khan, was put on the board of directors of the Islamic Free Market Institute. He too became a Republican Muslim operative for the Bush campaign and was uh, so highly regarded that he was given the position of Muslim gatekeeper in the public liaison office of the White House once President Bush was elected. In 2000, I'm sure you've seen this clip, I don't have it here with me, but uh, Abdurrahman al Amudi kind of flamed out at, a, at an event that this group co-sponsored in Lafayette Square. He got caught up in the moment and led the crowd in cheers about how he was a supporter of Hamas. Not to be outdone, he said, I'm also a supporter, Bill Clinton, of Hezbollah. You gotta wonder, did that give President Clinton any pause that a supporter of Hamas and Hezbollah was training our chaplains? But, the point is that at that point he became a little bit damaged goods, but it wasn't for another three years that he was finally caught trying to smuggle $300,000 into Britain for the purposes of paying for the murder of the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. The dough was given to him by a good friend, Muammar Gaddafi. That led to his undoing. He is currently serving 23 years in federal prison for terrorism and terrorism financing charges, including involvement with Al Qaeda. I'm going to close with a slide that might shock you particularly because the man that was the enabler of this enterprise is this one. He was the founding president of the Islamic Free Market Institute. He was the man who got Khalid Safuri into the Bush campaign. He was the man who got Suhail Khan into the White House. 
and subsequently into the transportation department as the assistant to the secretary of transportation for policy i didn't mention this but the picture that was down there between Abdurrahman al Moody and Suhail Khan is a picture of Suhail Khan's father, who started many of the most important Muslim Brotherhood fronts in America. And it was apparently about the time that that became known that they moved him from the White House over to the Transportation Department. But so those of you who think, well, that couldn't be too problematic, think of all the things that go on in the Transportation Department that you just as soon not have bad guys knowing about. I wanted to leave you with this particular slide because as Republicans, as Jewish Republicans, and for that matter, as citizens of this country, this is a problem. He has neither recanted his involvement with these guys or even acknowledged that what he has done has been to empower and legitimate and greatly enhance the influence operations our enemies are running against our government. And he did it under the watch of George W. Bush, I'm sorry to say, and he is continuing to do it under the current management. And to this point, I have found very few people who are willing to stand up with me to stop this. This cancer inside our movement, inside our party, inside our country. So I'll close with this. Uh, I'm going to close with this. The bottom line is the Muslim Brotherhood is the enemy. Make no mistake about it. I think they should be treated for what they are. As an engine of sedition in our country. And if you take nothing else away from this presentation or this book, I want to be two things, really. One is, not all Muslims adhere to Sharia. The ones that don't, I consider to be not the problem, at least not yet. The ones that do, are. And the second thing is, the ones that are engaged in Sharia are in fact pursuing a totalitarian, supremacist, and yes, seditious political program, which is illegal in the United States and must be prosecuted, not protected as religious Okay? So the next time somebody says to you you're a racist and a bigot and you're trying to prevent free practice of religion, what are you going to say? Look in the mirror. Nobody is more intolerant, more racist, including slavery, by the way, more bigoted, more <coughs> determined to deny everybody except them freedom of religion than these guys. And I'll close with this one last thought. If you're with me so far, there's a lot to be done. I want to specifically commend to you a, an action plan that the lawyer that has helped us for years now, David Yerushalmi, who lives here in Brooklyn, one of the finest legal minds I've ever encountered, an absolutely superb litigator by training and a specialist in Sharia by avocation. He has helped model something called American Laws for American courts. Two states have enacted a version of this law so far, Tennessee and Louisiana. Eighteen other states are currently in one stage or another of deliberation about it. I think the most recent was uh, the Alabama Senate, which unanimously approved it earlier this week. Maybe last week. We need help from people like you who have relationships with people in state legislatures, probably here, but certainly I imagine elsewhere as well, or know people who do, who can help us mobilize circles of influence 
to get this bill enacted. Because by so doing, we not only create a firewall against the insinuation into our courts of Sharia. It's facially neutral, as the lawyers say, by the way, folks. It doesn't specifically prohibit Sharia. It simply says any foreign law that does not conform to and respect, in my words, but this is the right idea, respect the Constitution of the United States and the laws promulgated pursuant to it may not be used in the courts of this state. Very straightforward. You'd think even the ACLU could get behind it, wouldn't you? No, no, I'll get carried away here. But listen, you can get behind it. And more to the point, I think state legislatures across the land can get behind it. Now, a version of it was promoted, it was not crafted by David or, you know, shaped in the sort of way that he shaped the so-called ALEC, American Laws for American Courts Bill. But it was put to the test in Oklahoma in the last election. And as you may know, 70% of the people who voted voted explicitly to amend the Constitution of Oklahoma so as to preclude Sharia from being practiced in the state. CARE, within hours, got a federal judge to strike it down as unconstitutional because it was not facially neutral. It specifically went after Sharia. And that judge didn't know beans about Sharia. But what we're doing now, and what you could literally start helping with tomorrow, is getting this kind of legislation going, not only because I believe it can help prevent the insinuation of Sharia through our courts, it can help pick fights, which in every single state where it's happening, enable us to educate the public and to get them engaged in fighting the Muslim Brotherhood and others trying to bring Sharia here through violence or through stealth. And in short, words to live by, literally to live by, keep America Sharia free. Thank you very much. So folks, we've got time for a few questions. Uh, we'll try to get to as many folks as possible. We have just a few. Please ask a quick question, and Mr. Gaffney will give you a quick answer. What time is he on Fox? What time is he on Fox? I think it's 10, 15. Fox Business, Fox Business. Right. Right. Okay. So we'll, we will repeat the question, so that's what I guess we Last slide, uh, why should uh, the Muslim Brotherhood be successful in the United States? And the Communist flag do sounded like exactly the same thing, and obviously it's just important to say it. It's a great question. Uh, why, why would uh, these guys get away with it when the communists didn't? Well, I think of this as communism with a god. And the problem is, you put that god thing in there, and all of a sudden these guys understand and are brilliant at exploiting the protection of our civil liberties to work their insidious, seditious program. And again, that's the point. We need to strip that away. And by describing Sharia accurately, it is communism, minus the God. So looking at this slide, the Brotherhood should be treated as a seditious entity as communism was in the past. And based on that last question, what about the communists that we know have infiltrated our government right now and are infiltrating along with the radical Islamists in other countries that you see happening in Europe, such as these uprisings, for example, in Egypt, what if that's another uh, front that these people are using? Are you concerned that that communism and Islamic uh, partnership is alive and well and working even where the Islamists can't do it alone here? Basically, it is, uh, what about the communists that are in our government now? The mic is off. The mic is off. My mic is off? <laughs> I'll, I'll speak up. Um, uh, the mic is out for two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. Thank you for being close. 
my auditors who thought they weren't going to let them come back on. So if it does come back on, that would be a good thing. Uh, look, communists in our government, or in governments elsewhere, or in colonies, in government, are a great enabler of these guys. In fact, what I think we see more and more of is eventually the ACLU. You have a green, red axis that operates in most of these countries where the left, you think, would understand that they have an interest in not having these guys succeed. Because let's face it, folks, who gets the knife first? Feminists? Gays? Jews? Liberals? Other human beings? I mean, Look, if nothing else out of a sense of survival, you think they'd stay up. But unfortunately, what seems to operate with these guys is they hate us more than they love their own lives. So they're willing, or maybe they can't really believe that nice homosexuals like them will become, but they're nonetheless going to help enable this on the grounds that anything that weakens common foe is this horrible imperialist America is a good thing. So this is a real problem. That's the right. The mic is back. Okay. Right. So, uh, I so, uh, well, George Soros and his involvement in all this, uh, a great question. Uh, I, it'll be one of history's most important archival exercises to figure out all of the things George Soros was doing in his malevolent heyday. I mean, from just destroying currencies and bankrupting nations to actually subverting this country and other freedom-loving nations through his various machinations, his collaboration with our enemies, his financing of fifth column elements, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain that he will be shown to have been deeply involved with Brotherhood organizations as well. And in fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a news item out tonight on that, and I think we'll be talking about it on the show, so stay tuned. We are from New Jersey, and we are currently uh, fighting the Muslim uh, attorney who was appointed by Chris Christie, the governor. Now, I sent all the documents that you mentioned to our state representatives and representatives, and also a very good friend of Charlie Adams, who's also fighting it. We don't know what else to do. I mean, we're, we're kind of hoping that the nomination gets put in file 13. But right now, you know, there's about 20 of us who are deeply concerned about this. And we just don't know where else to go. And we were hoping, we know that your organization was involved in this. Do you know where we stand with this? I don't, to be honest with you, you're following it more closely than I, but I, I think this is a page out of the Irene Alder handbook. We need to get you involved with our team who are working problems like this and see what we can do to help. Look, I gotta tell you, uh, you know, the guy who's on that last slide, is a champion of libertarian agenda items across the board. He thinks Chris Christie hung the moon. Uh, and, you know, for all I know, he's a very capable guy. But on things like this, he's a problem. And I'd like to think, as a former U.S. attorney, that he would be sensitive to the need to be responsible and not to put brotherhood at least criminal defenders, if not actual operatives, on the bench well, in his state. Sent, we also sent our documents um, to Peter King. You know, we got him involved being at the time that he was doing the um, the hearings. So I well, he's going to do more hearings, and okay. maybe that we can get to that. But look, let's right. let's see what we can do to compare notes and cross the line. Yes, uh, I feel that you know, at least for four years now, until hopefully Obama is going to be leaving the White House. Four more years? No, no. no. Four. Oh, four. Four total. 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 Four
Well, the good news is that in 2008, the FBI officially, at the headquarters level, broke off the intimate embrace that they had of the Council on American Islamic Relations. Evidently, they were persuaded that the evidence that was going to be produced in the Holy Land Foundation trial was going to make that a little tacky to say the least. <laughs> um, Louis Gomer, a terrific member of Congress from Texas, was, as you may know, in the Judiciary Committee with uh, Bob Mueller, the outgoing uh, director of the FBI, and he asked him why it was that if the FBI was monitoring the organizational meeting of this Hamas front organization in 1993, it wasn't until 2008, when it was all about to become public, that they decided to distance themselves from these guys. Yeah. A very fair question, to which he did not get a very good answer. The point that I want to make sure you think about is, we may only have two more years of Barack Obama. We're going to have 10 more years after that, excuse me, eight more years after that and two years under his administration for the next FBI director to operate. He is about to appoint the next FBI director to a 10-year term. And he's talking about, we're told, people like Jamie Gorelick and Janet Napolitano. And I bet there's a communist czar or somewhere in the mix, too. But this, this bears considerable watch, I believe, and uh, hopefully we'll be all over it. I am a member of the old profession, but my college fraternity brother, Tom Hector, who runs this one, and he was the untouchable, other than that, said, follow the money. Can you do comments on Stuart Levy's failures at GFI and what David Cohen has to accomplish those folks? Well, this is a good question. Um, I'm not sure which of the oldest professions you're associating yourself with. <laughs> um, the, the question, you're not that kind of guy. Um, this, this question, this question um, probably does not qualify for a short answer. I will try to do justice to it in the shortest of time. Stuart Levy just left the Treasury Department as the undersecretary responsible for following the money and trying to stop bad guys from being able to use it against us. And I think, frankly, he was one of the better public servants of his generation. Uh, he didn't get everything perfectly right, but he did stop a lot of bad guys from doing bad things. It pained me, particularly, when George W. Bush decided to stop him from stopping one of the particular onerous bad guys, North Korea, by essentially drying up its access to some of its banking uh, resources uh, in Macau. Um, my fault with Stuart basically is that he did not fight Sharia compliant finance. And the reason that I emphasize that is that I, I really think of all of these stealth jihadi techniques, this is the single most insidious. I don't know if our host would be willing to speak to this, but I can tell you that it's all over Wall Street. And again, just a word about what it is. What makes a given transaction Sharia compliant is at the end of the day, not that it doesn't involve interest or doesn't involve pork or gambling or tobacco or alcohol or pornography or Western defense. It's not supposed to go to any of those kinds of things, of course. What it ultimately comes down to is that some Sharia authority tells you it is Sharia compliant. And why that's important is 
every single one of the Sharia authorities employed by the government or by other financial institutions believes in Sharia, espouses its supremacist program, wants it to triumph over all of us. The more candid of them, in fact, a fellow you may have come across by the name of Yusuf Akharadawi, you saw him. He was the one in Tahrir Square a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. leading two million people in a chant, on to Jerusalem. So he could pray in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I mean, something right out of Khomeini's return to Mexico. This guy is one of the most prominent Sharia advisors in the financial industry known as Sharia compliant finance in the world. And you know what he calls the business? Jihad with money. I'm going to tell you one other fun fact to know and tell. Do you know who owns the largest purveyor of Sharia compliant insurance products in the world? You do. Assuming you're all paying taxes, you are all paying taxes. Right? If you are, as a taxpayer, you own AIG. And our colleague David Yarashalmi, God bless him, has brought suit on behalf of an Iraq War veteran up in Michigan in federal court testing the proposition that that is unconstitutional. To have the U.S. government owning a company that is actively promoting not just Sharia compliant finance, my friends, but Sharia itself. And in fact, in the course of discovery, David established that over a billion dollars of our money in that bailout went directly into the Sharia compliant insurance division of AIG. So we got problems, and Stuart Levy helped up to a point, but he rolled over when the powers that be and the Bush administration said, we're doing Sharia compliant finance. And his successor, I suspect, <laughs> is under orders that that's going to continue to go forward. If we don't stop that, it's a matter of time, frankly, till they win. Because they've got access to the capital and credit flows of this country, and they're able to move mountains in government, in the private sector, in the public at large, with that power. So that's what kind of work we've got cut out for us. All right, folks, so we've run out of time. We're going to do the book signing now. Thank you very much.